Welcome to Grace Online. My name is Matt, and today we are wrapping up our series, Cycle Breaker, talking about what it takes to be the person that breaks the cycles of dysfunction in your family and in your own life and choose to write a new story for generations to come. But what if that cycle that you thought you beat creeps back into your life? And the things that you committed to staying away from are the things that you find yourself going back to. Does that mean that you failed, that you really can't break this cycle so there's no point in trying? In this video, we're gonna see that the thing that all of us truly need to break a cycle is often the thing that we don't wanna show, vulnerability. But just because you may have messed up doesn't mean that God is done writing your story. Take a listen. I'm embarrassed to tell you that at the beginning of COVID, I downloaded an app to help me get in shape, which is a nice way of saying to lose weight. It, um, it, it, it had to do with intermittent fasting, which is basically just skipping breakfast and not snacking at night. Then I had some other exercises to strengthen your core and to work out your lower body and to get your heart rate up and things like that. And I did really good with it for about a month, and then I quit. And I started and then I quit, and I realized this app doesn't work. So I got a different app uh, a few months later. So about six months later, I got another app. I thought I'd try it again. Same thing happened, I, I, I stuck with it for a little bit, and this one was about counting calories. And I was, I was doing that until I didn't want to do it anymore, and then I stopped keeping up with it and stopped putting it into the app, and then I realized this app is stupid, it doesn't work either. And another six months go by, and I, I downloaded a third app. And what's funny, I checked today, I have three apps that basically do the same thing on my phone, and my opinion is that they all three stink because none of them work. And the reason why I say that they don't work is because I bailed on them and they didn't keep me. They didn't keep me on the plan. And I didn't get into the shape that I was looking for. So I gave up on those things because I think that they're dumb. Now, you and I both know that the problem isn't the app. The problem is, is me. I don't, I don't like doing hard things. You probably don't like doing hard things either. I'm not alone in that. I would say that for both of us, the more outside our comfort zone something is, the less likely we are to stick with it, right? Like how many of us have made a New Year's resolution only to make the same resolution the next year because we didn't stick with it? I'll bet there's a couple of resolutions that you may have made even more than twice, three or four or five or six times maybe even. How many of us have said that we would wake up early, we'd work out, we'd get a cold shower to get the body going, and then we'd get to work a half hour early? Or uh, maybe you said that you'd start going to bed sooner, that you would quit procrastinating, uh, or that you would work on your anger, you'd work on your lust, you'd start being less selfish, more generous, uh, you'd, you'd work on making friends or forgiving or letting go of something traumatic in your past only to find that all of these resolutions and new leaves have been turned over later, you're still stuck struggling with the same things. And we've established that each one of us are born with a taste for a particular sin. Whether we're born this way or we're developed into this way doesn't really matter because it's not a healthy thing. It actually, in a lot of cases, goes against what God has specifically said about the way that we should be living our lives. And these things get passed down. Environmentally or genetically, it doesn't matter. The problem is that my problems become a problem for other people. Like, I, I have to deal with this. I'm the one who's responsible for what I do, and I can't keep blaming it on everybody else. The neat thing that we've learned in this series is that when we turn to God, not only does he forgive us and clean us out from all of that guilt and shame, which is unbelievably awesome, but he also gives us a new identity. The metaphor that he uses is um, adoption. Whereas before we were spiritually dead, the Bible says, or we're like orphans, we're apart from God. And then by God's grace, he chooses to pick us up off the streets, spiritually speaking, and adopts us into his family and gives us a new name and a new identity, which explains why there were things that you did when you were spiritually orphaned that now that you're a follower of God, you've called on Jesus to forgive you and save you. 
you placed your faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection to fully wipe away your sin. You've invited Jesus to become a part of your life. Now, these things bother you, and they didn't before. Like that's, And that's been a weird experience for you. That's just the evidence of God having given you a new identity. And we said last week, that was, that was God's part, giving you the new identity, get, placing his Holy Spirit inside of you who begins to change your wants. And your job is to let the Holy Spirit start transforming you. But you also have a job, which is to put off certain things and to put on certain things. And this is going to require an unrelenting, radical, passionate commitment to obedience to God, regardless of what it costs, trusting that on the other side of my obedience, God will make it worth it. That's awesome. And I wish I could say that's all you needed to know. But from my personal experience, what I found is that that does really, really good. Like I'm 100% determined. I, I, will, I will put down that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I will not go to, uh, to McDonald's and get that ice cream cone. I will not get that Chick-fil-A sandwich. I will not get those Wendy's French fries. I will not do it until I do it, <laughs> right? I, I, it works for a while, and then it doesn't. What's going to happen is sometime a month from now, two months from now, I don't know, a year from now, the sin that you have been working on, this disobedience towards God, this selfishness towards others, like whatever in this series that God has brought up is the cycle that perpetually brings you back into dysfunction that you're working on. You're going to get freedom from it by God's grace, which is awesome. And when you least expect it, it's going to jump up and bite you in the butt. Now, I hope that doesn't happen. But if that happens to you, if you find yourself a month from now falling right back into the same stupid thing that you've, in this series, begged God's forgiveness for and thought you found freedom in, don't quit. If you fall back into the same stupid thing, Like that's not uncommon. You're not beyond hope. And it's not, it's not pointless. And we learn that in the life of one of Jesus' most famous disciples. We learn it. And what we learn is that each one of us need someone outside of us who's reaching into our life, somebody that we've given access to. And we're going to need this person to do three specific things for us. We're going to need them to, one, remind us who we are. Two, we're going to need them to have a difficult conversation with us when we don't want to. And three, we're going to need that person to love us unconditionally. So we need someone to remind us who we are. Now, we've talked about the way that God gives us a new identity when we place our faith and trust in Jesus and ask him to be part of our life. And God uh, does this in the life of Simon. He gives him a new identity. And you see this in the very first chapter of the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard uh, what John, John the Baptist, had said about Jesus and then, and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus, looking intently at Simon. Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John. I wonder if he was like, I know. I just told you that, right? <laughs> and then Jesus says this. Jesus goes, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And then when you read the rest of the book of John, what you find is that Peter, while in this new relationship with Jesus, continues to struggle living out this new identity. He perpetually slips back into his old rhythms of sin, disobedience towards God, and selfishness towards others. You see this, like he, he's the one disciple that Jesus gets on to the most. He's the disciple who's always saying the most awkward thing at the most awkward time. I'll give you just a few examples. In Matthew chapter 16, Peter rebukes Jesus when Jesus says, we've got to go to Jerusalem where I'm going to be killed and I'm going to be uh, buried, but I'll raise from the dead on the third day. Peter gets, gets on to him. Why? Because Peter wanted Jesus to 
like kick some Roman butt. How's that going to happen if he's dead? So Peter, again, is more interested in himself than Jesus, so much so that he gets on to Jesus. Like, can you imagine doing that? Uh, I think it's crazy. Matthew chapter 17, Peter awkwardly suggests to God the Father that he, Peter, be allowed to build three altars, one to Jesus, one to Moses, and one to Elijah. This is such an awkward moment that nobody even responds to it. Have you ever been at a party, everybody's talking, and then you thought you had something funny to say? So you kind of like threw it out there, right? And then it was like, cricket, 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 and you felt like an idiot. That's exactly, that. it's hilarious. It's in, it's in Matthew chapter 17. I'll let you read it in your own time. It's, it's, it's a funny, to me it's funny, because Peter says this grand thing, he gets everybody's attention, and he says this, and God's like, anyway, and it goes right back to what he was saying. In John chapter 18, Peter, the fisherman, is packing heat. He's got a sword, and he whips it out and tries to chop off somebody's head. Uh, that Yeah, and, he, and he, he stunk at that. He was not a trained warrior. That was, that was embarrassing. And in Matthew chapter 26, Peter famously brags that he would never betray Jesus. And then Jesus says, not only will you betray me, but you'll do it three times before the rooster crows two times. And Peter said, though I die, I'll never do that. And then did it. Now we're going to be looking at that story in just a few minutes. But there's a guy named Paul Tripp. He's a pastor who's also a counselor, two pastors. He's written several books on overcoming spiritual battles in ourselves. But I highly recommend them. Anyway, he said this, we always live out of some kind of identity and the identities that we assign ourselves influence our responses in life. The longer we struggle with a problem, the more likely we are to define ourselves by that problem. Problems like our divorce or addiction or depression or ADHD or codependency, he says. And we come to believe that our problems are who we are. And some of us have done that. We think I'm just always going to, this is just who I, this is me, right? So we're acting out in this wrong identity and we need somebody to remind us of our true identity. In 1 John chapter 3, uh, John does this. He says, see how very much our Father loves us because he calls us his children. And that is what we are. So John goes, you are God's children. That's why, like, you've forgotten. And I'm reminding you, like, the, right toward the end of this letter, you are a child of God. You are not you're not doomed to perpetuate the same dysfunctions of your parents or the people that raised you or the way you've lived the last 10, 15 years. You're a child of God. All these things, everything's new now. He goes on to say, but the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children, but that's only because they don't know him. So they wouldn't know who his kids are or not. Verse two says, dear friends, those who've also turned from sin, repented, God, I'm letting go of my sin to follow you. Placing our faith and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to fully pay off and to wipe away and to take away our sins, having invited Jesus to become a part of our life. Those people, dear friends, he says, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation of someday becoming like Jesus will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. So he says that we are God's children because we are. And then he says all of those who have the expectation of becoming like Jesus as a result of what God's Holy Spirit is trying to do in our heart will keep themselves pure, will stay away from sin. So if that's me, and it is, why do I then keep slipping back into my sin? And Peter says, it's because you forget that you're a child of God. Like that's what Peter, John is reminding you, you're a child of God. Like remembering who you are is going to be the thing that helps you stay pure from the sin that is in your life. And Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, the more you grow like this, the more, the more you grow in your faith. The more you grow in your faith, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way, those who run back to their old junk, who slip back into their old cycles, those people are short-sighted or blind 
Why do I become short-sighted and blind? He says, because you forgot that you've been cleansed from your old sins. You forgot who you are. You stopped remembering what God has done for you and who he says you are, that these things no longer define who you are. They have no more authority over you, right? That's why you forget who you are. So while Jacob, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is often called uh, Israel, uh, Peter was Simon, and then he becomes Peter. And when Jesus, uh, when, when Peter messes up, he, one time, and we're going to get to it, but Jesus continues to call him Peter, reminding him of who he is. You're Peter, you're Peter, you're Peter. And every time he calls him Peter, he's reminding him of who he is, right? Now there's a time, and we're going to get to that, where Peter, hardcore, runs back to his junk. And Jesus treats him the way he did the first time. And he calls him Simon. But when he calls him Simon, he calls him back to himself. It's a really beautiful thing, and we're going to get there in just a few minutes. But each one of us, we need somebody who's going to remind us who we are. I need somebody to remind me, I'm not Jacob anymore, I'm Israel. I'm not Simon anymore, I'm not, I'm, I'm Peter. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm Sean now, I'm not my fear. Uh, or in my wife's case, you're Billy Jane, you're not your obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, you're a child of God, you're not your lust, you're not your pride, you're not your anger, you're not your bitterness. You need somebody who's gonna come find you when you slip up and remind you of who you are. Same thing that you need. You need someone who's gonna have a hard conversation with you. I told you a few minutes ago that we were gonna come back to that awkward conversation where Peter rebukes Jesus, and we're doing that uh, now. Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. Peter took Jesus aside when Jesus said that we're gonna to go to Jerusalem so I can be killed, but I'll raise from the dead on the third day. And this is what happens. Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, Peter said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turns and looks Peter right in the face. He doesn't let him get away with this. Like he's, why does Peter not want this to happen? especially when he knows because of the Hebrew scriptures that this is supposed to happen. Because if Jesus is killed by the Romans, this means that Jesus isn't going to throw off the Romans. Peter isn't going to get what he wants. So he steps in and he gets on to Jesus. Not because he cares about Jesus' agenda. He cares about his own. That's what he cares about. And Jesus looks right at him and he says, Get away from me, Satan. Why does he call him Satan? I, I, don't, I don't have a conclusive answer. I have an opinion. There's only one other person who tried talking Jesus out of going to the cross, and that's in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says that Satan brings Jesus up, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, you don't need to die. If you will just bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you, and you don't have to die. Right? Satan is the only other person who'd ever tempted Jesus to not go through with his death, his sacrifice for all of mankind. Peter's the only other person who took Satan's side on that. So Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I know where that idea comes from, and I know who influenced you, right? Like, I know where this... Satan, Peter's the only disciple who took Satan's position when it comes to the agenda of Jesus. And Jesus calls him out on it. And then he says, uh, you are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things from merely a human point of view not from God's. Then Jesus goes on to say to the rest of the disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. You've got to let go of your agenda, Peter. All of you do. You've got to be willing to take up your cross and follow me. But if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you profit? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? So Jesus goes straight to the point of Peter's selfishness right? And he addresses it. Uh, and every one of us, by the way, are also going to be tempted uh, to go back to world ways. Every one of us are going to be tempted to sell our soul for the world. Every one of us are going to be tempted by something in, you're going to be tempted by your cycle. That's what it is. Like whatever it is that you've been dealing with in this series, whatever you feel, is the sin that's been passed down or that you've had for the longest amount of time, 
God has given you a new identity and you know this and it doesn't fit who you are. You've made a radical commitment to obedience to God because you trust that that's the path towards not just honoring God, but also receiving everything that God intended for you to experience in your life. But at some point, all of these things that defined your life in the world apart from God is going to sneak back up and you're going to be tempted to trade, right? Everything that God's doing in your life to go back to that. And you need somebody who's like Peter had with Jesus is going to get in your face and say, don't be a moron. Because every one of us are sometimes a moron. You need somebody who's going to get in your face when you fall off the wagon, when you blow up at your wife or at work or, I don't know, like when you just slip, when you go back to the way that you were, when you slip back into your pattern of sin and dysfunction, you need somebody who's going to get on to you. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had some really cool things to say about that kind of a friend. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, it says, Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Who's going to be that person who's going to softly wound you to tell you what nobody else is willing to tell you? Who is the friend that would risk hurting your feelings in order to save your life? That's like, like three months from now, that's what's going to keep you from going back to your cycle. Having that friend who has that kind of access in your life. That person's going to step into your life and go, no, 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 no. Like, where you been? I haven't seen you in church in a while, right? How, how's your marriage going? How are you doing in your singleness? Possibly. How are you doing with your lust? How are you doing with your finances? How are you doing with your boss at work? How are you doing with your family? Like, they're going to ask you the question that you really don't want everybody else to ask, but somebody needs to be asking you these things. Somebody needs to have access to this. I can't tell you the number of times I've had close friends. I've had Pastor Ken risk hurting my feelings to tell me something I needed to hear that helped me continue following after Jesus. You need that person in your life because you're going to be tempted to sacrifice the right path for something else. And anytime we sacrifice the right path for the easy path, we become idolaters and are guilty of worshiping the thing that we wanted more than we wanted God. And somebody needs to tell you and me when we've lost our mind and we've become morons. And that leads me to the third and final thing. You need somebody who's going to have a hard conversation. You need somebody who's going to remind you who you are, that this isn't what you, this isn't who you are, right? They're going to, they're going to say the hard things, but this person has to be somebody who loves you unconditionally. That's the only person you'd receive it from. As somebody that you were convinced loved you no matter what. Remember that night? I told you that Peter betrayed Jesus three times. Uh, he does. And Jesus said that this would happen before the rooster crows a second time. And the rooster crows a second time. And Peter's like, oh no. Like not only did he take Satan's side three weeks earlier on their way to Jerusalem, but he had just famously at the Last Supper said to Jesus in front of everybody, I'll never deny you. Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. He said, though I die, you're wrong. And then he just did it. So he took Satan's side and he's the only disciple who denied Jesus. He knew Jesus had already said, if anybody denies me before men, I'll deny them before my Father in heaven. Peter knows that. He heard him say it. And now he's the one that denied him. Not just once, but three times. On the night that he's betrayed and he's tortured all night long and tomorrow morning he's crucified. The Bible says that Peter broke down and sobbed. Uh, that, that is a completely normal response. If I'm Peter, I'm, I'm quitting. I feel like the worst, the worst person in the history of the world. Like, it's not like I, yeah, it'd be bad to betray the trust of a spouse or your kids, but I betrayed God and the flesh, not once, but three times. And I took Satan's side against him. Like, what hope do I have? On the morning of the third day, the women go to the tomb of Jesus to finish preparing the body because they didn't have a chance to. Because on Friday when Jesus was crucified, it was a Sabbath. 
or it was going to be Sabbath. And so when the sun was setting, they couldn't do any work. So they had to take down his body and wrap it real quick. And they were going to finish on the third day, on Sunday. They were going to come back and after the Sabbath was over and finish the job. A year later, then they would take his bones, put them in an ossuary, and then they would stack it with the rest of his family. But when they come back on the third day, his body's gone and there's two angels that are there. And here's what the angels tell the two ladies who came back on Sunday morning. Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. And you'll see him there just as he told you before he died. Why did the angels who told them to go back and tell the disciples that Jesus is resurrected, but go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus will meet you in Galilee? Why do they say, and Peter? Because they were instructed to. Why? Because God knew what Peter was thinking. Like, what would you be thinking? I quit. I'm the worst. And God goes, don't you forget to go get Peter. Make sure he knows I want to see him also. That's, that's what happens. Then you get to meet, you get to see their meeting in John chapter 21. Verse 15, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, remember this is the time I told you he was gonna call him Simon again? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my, my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. Verse 17, a third time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. What I love is that for every time that Peter had blown it, he gives them the opportunity to find grace. What does that tell me? One, that God loved Peter unconditionally. God loves me unconditionally. And every time I run back to my cycle, God still comes after me with, with love and grace. It reminds me of uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, where it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. That's what Peter needed. He needed grace and truth. He needed truth for sure, but he needed truth caked in grace, <laughs> like unconditional love. That's what he needed. So in spite of his constant flops and failures, Jesus keeps coming back, coming after him. Bro, you're mine. I'm not letting you go. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I'm not going anywhere. You can take Satan's side against me, but I love you. You can deny me once and I love you. You can deny me twice and I love you. You can deny me three times and I love you. Like, do you think there's ever a point where God goes, now I'm done with you? I got, no. I love you unconditionally, he says. So I need somebody who genuinely cares enough about me to come after me with grace and truth. And truthfully, you do also. That the about three weeks after this story, Jesus tells Peter and the rest of the disciples to go out and to do for others what Jesus had been doing for them, and he does. In fact, Peter says at the end of his ministry in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, he says, most important of all, he says to the church, most important of all of my instructions to you guys, he says this, continue to show deep love for each other. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. That's why. How did Peter know that? because Peter experienced it. He experienced it from Jesus. He showed it to others. In fact, one of the guys that he had mentored was a guy named John Mark. John Mark is famous in the book of Acts because he's Barnabas's cousin. Barnabas is famous because he's the one that mentored St. Paul. So Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas has a cousin named John Mark. When Paul and Barnabas are gonna go throughout the Roman Empire on their first trip to tell everybody to turn from sin and follow Jesus, Barnabas says, I want to take my cousin, John Mark. Paul says, all right. And about halfway through the trip, John Mark quits. He quits ministry. He's homesick, doesn't want to do this anymore, doesn't want to help people find and follow Jesus. He just wants to go home. And truthfully, he's a little bit of a baby. So he goes home. Then when 
Paul and Barnabas finish up their trip. They go back home to Antioch, and then they're going to leave again. And Barnabas says, I want to bring John Mark. Paul says, no, I'm done with him. I'm done with him. Barnabas says, I want to bring him. Paul says, we're not bringing him. Barnabas says, we are bringing him. Bible says the contention between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark was so contentious that they split up. They did. They completely parted ways. And there were two people that stepped into John Mark's life, Peter and Barnabas. And because Peter and Barnabas showed love to this kid who had failed, in 2 Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy, Paul's writing to his guy he's mentoring, actually two different places, I believe it's in Colossians also. Later on in life, Paul says about John Mark that he's become profitable for ministry. Why had John Mark, the guy that he abandoned, his best friend Barnabas, because he didn't want to spend time with this other kid, why did he say this other kid had become profitable? It wasn't because of anything that Paul had done in his life. It was because of Barnabas and Peter, because they showed a ton of love to this kid and loved help that kid cover the multitude of sins. You need to find somebody that you trust and respect spiritually who's going to do this for you. And you need to do this for others. This is how, long-term, we break the cycle of sin and dysfunction in our lives. The sin, especially, that keeps creeping back up. Every one of us are gonna slip up. We all backslide, or we slide back into our old patterns, our old habits. And most of the time, the Holy Spirit does speak softly into our heart and calls us back to himself. But at other times, he sends somebody to bring us back. Now, I experienced this as a kid. My dad can whistle. Takes his fingers like this. I'm not going to do it for you now. It'd, it'd, mess, it'd mess up this, this, the speakers. So I'm not going to whistle inside. But he'd whistle, and we could be a block or two away, and we'd hear him, and we'd be playing with our friends, and we'd hear our dad whistle, and we'd go, oh, I got, I got to go home. So whenever my dad wanted us to come back, he would whistle. But sometimes we'd be a little bit farther than normal. And when dad would go outside and he'd whistle and we didn't hear him, so we didn't come back, dad never gave up on us. Dad would reach out to the other brother and say, hey, go find your brother and bring him home. And that's what you need. You need somebody for the day three, four, five months from now when you've lost your mind, you need that person that you're going to listen to that God can say to that person, go find you because you've lost your mind because you're not listening to God anymore. So he's gonna, you need that friend that is listening to God, that's going to come to you, <laughs> remind you who you are, have a difficult conversation with you, and who's going to love you no matter how far you slid back into your old ways. That's the only way Peter was able to keep going. It's the only way John Mark was able to keep going. It's the only way I can keep going. It's the only way you can keep going. Simon Sinek. I don't think he's a Christian. I don't know if he is. Maybe he is. Or he is. I, don't, I don't know. But he wrote a book called Leaders Eat Last. It's not a Christian book. It's just a leadership book. But here's what he said. He said, ask anyone who's made it through any sort of setback, depression, loneliness, failure, getting fired, a death in the family, the loss of a relationship, addiction, legal conflict, victimization by crime, anything. Ask them how they made it through. In nearly 100% of the cases, they will say something to the effect that I could, have, I could not have done it without the support of fill in the blank, and it's a person. Whose name are you gonna write in? That I don't think six months from now I can make it without the support of, who, who do you pick? Like let that person know that you appreciate their spiritual influence in your life, and that if they ever see you slipping up, that they need to come tell you about it, right? That they need to get in, like give somebody permission to speak hard truths into your life if you're serious about breaking these patterns, these cycles of sin in your life. Here's another question. Who would write your name in that line? Who would write your name in the line? You need to be that for somebody else. If all this church is for you is just a service, uh, honestly, I think you're going to keep struggling with your cycle of sin. I really do. What you really need, like somehow you've got to step out from the crowd and get to know people here. Like I really do believe that the person that you need is here in this church. And I think the person that needs you is here in this church. So pray about it. 
God, help me to find somebody that I respect and whose company I enjoy and whose opinion I, 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 I trust to remind me who I am, have hard conversations and show me unconditional love. And God brings somebody into my life that I can do that for also. Man, I really hope that you were encouraged and challenged by this video. And if you have missed any of the weeks in this series, you can catch up on all of them by clicking on the link that's in the description. And if this series has been really helpful to get you thinking and you want to keep going and get super practical about breaking the cycles in your life, we have a free 12-week online cohort starting up that's an awesome opportunity for you to learn with others just like you who are working to break cycles in their lives. We'll have live video content, Q&As, and discussion boards all centered around helping you understand your cycles and how you can break them. And if you are even watching later, all the content will be on demand so you can catch up with the conversation. Just click on the link that's in the comments and come and join us for this. That's all for now. Hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you again next time.